At Northrop Grumman, innovation isn't just an idea. It's a way of life. The value of performance. Northrop Grumman. So we're going to uh, quickly talk about uh, work we do in tornadoes and hurricanes and other kinds of really good weather. Uh, we just came back from a big blizzard study that was up uh, along Lake Ontario. So really any kind of, any kind of good weather we're, uh, we're out there looking at. We're really trying to understand about tornadoes uh, for scientific purposes. We have lots of fancy scientific questions, but the main things we want to learn about are what's inside. It's a difficult environment to study. It's very violent. Um, it's actually probably not as bad as the ocean in terms of being really deadly if you're down below, but being inside a tornado, um, pretty nasty place. Winds are 200 miles an hour. You know, chickens and cows and bricks and everything are blowing around. It's, it's a nasty place. And not only do we need to know how strong the winds are inside and how they do damage, but we really need to know better what causes them. We know the broad strokes of which days are going to get tornadoes. And you probably hear there's tornado watches and things like that. But nobody really knows an hour ahead of time where exactly a tornado is going to go. In fact, even when a tornado forms, we don't know exactly where it's going to go, how strong it's going to be, how long it's going to last. We really have pretty primitive skills in, in the precise forecast which people need um, if they're not going to be running for their basements too often. 75% uh, of tornado warnings are false alarms. Well, that's not true with winter storm warnings. You know, if a snowstorm is forecast, most of the time snow happens. If a hurricane's forecast, pretty much a hurricane's going to happen. But with tornadoes, most of the time it, it doesn't. We're just full of false alarms. And it's very challenging to get measurements. As I mentioned, the environment inside, just full of debris and damage. Uh, if you try to get observations, uh, you can try to get student volunteers. But, you know, once you send somebody in and their car gets like that, they, they don't want to come out again next year. Um, so it's, it's hard to get measurements that's there, quite hostile. We don't have those great uh, ships like, like Dave Gallo has that you can send down there. Um, maybe if we had a few of those, we could get inside tornadoes easier. So one of the methods we try to use to understand tornadoes is the Fujita scale. Um, so instead of having measurements in there, uh, you can just look at what happened when the tornado went through. And you can see on the left, that's a tornado that did just some mild damage. Now I say mild, but in tornadoes, you know, in the tornado book, that's pretty light. Uh, basically, it just lifted the roofs off those apartments. On the right, you see what's moderate damage. It lofted some cars. It pretty much destroyed the homes. Um, but severe damage, everything's wiped out all the way down to the foundation. But the problem is it's very crude information. You don't know when in the tornado that happened. Was it the beginning or the end? Or, you know, how exactly did those buildings fall apart? Um, the other biggest problem is that most tornadoes don't hit buildings. And even the ones that do only hit them for small percentages of their lifetime. And if you've ever flown over what are called the flyover states, basically Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Texas, the areas where a lot of tornadoes happen, um, most of it is just open country. They're not hitting any buildings, so you can't use this technique. So what we do is, is we study these storms with mobile radars. Um, and so most radars are going to be just much too far away to see a tornado. But if we get up close to the tornado, like this radar here is deployed, and there's that guy out there watching it with some cameras, but we're waiting for that tornado to come to us, and we can make maps of the tornado. So basically, we put, the tornado, we, we put our radars right up close to a storm, and you, maybe if you've been watching TV weather or documentaries and things, that's a supercell thunderstorm, and it kind of has this hook on the edge, and that hook is full of rain and hail, and there's one pixel there at the end, that yellow pixel, which is where the tornado is. If you're far away, that's what you see. If you get up close, you can see much more detail. And if we put our radar right up close to that hook echo, we can slice through a tornado. And if you slice through a cone, like an ice cream cone, um, and those of you who are getting some geometry in school, you might have learned conic sections. If you slice through an ice cream cone or a cone, you get a circle or an ellipse. And that's exactly what we see when we get close up and slice through the tornado. We see that ring there on the left. And that ring is the ring of debris. And I said it's dirt, gravel, cows, whatever's been lofted by the tornado is spinning around in there. And then on the right is the Doppler, and the Doppler basically t tells us about the winds, how fast the winds are spinning in that tornado. If we take a vertical slice through that same tornado, again, imagine that same ice cream cone, but you take a vertical slice through a cone, you get a parabola or a hyperbola, something like that, and there's a parabola of debris, because um, that's a vertical slice through a tornado. There's a clear central eye and this big parabola of debris coming up uh, that's been lofted up from the ground. And it's mostly dirt and gravel, but it could be construction material, anything that uh, has been lofted by the tornado. This is a tornado where we've zoomed in really close, and there's that red on one side there on the right image and that blue on the other, and that indicates wind moving away from us or towards us. 
But in addition, there are these little circulations. So instead of just one spinning thing, there's actually little ball bearings kind of spinning around. They're called multiple vortices or subvortices. The strongest winds in some tornadoes are in those little vortices. Um, and we've been able to map those out just by getting up really close to the tornadoes. Everything about our studies is about getting up close, getting near or, or into things. There's some more images of very complicated structures. That red and uh, blue on the top shows that the winds are strong in the tornado, but in this case, they were even stronger on the outside. Um, and if you look at that ring there, you can see on the top right, there's a ring there of green and yellow, and that's actually the tornado debris cloud. And then it's clear in that blue area, and then it gets a lot of rain and hail outside again. So a very complex looking structure. If we have multiple radars, we can do what we call dual Doppler which means we look at the Doppler from different angles and we can see the wind vectors. And the wind vectors are very important to us because the whole math of the atmosphere is vector math. Uh, and we need to know the wind speeds and wind directions. And if we know that, then we can also learn things about whether the air is moving up or down. Those blue areas are air moving down and the red areas are air moving up. And you can see where the air is spinning really fast in the center of the tornado. But those downdrafts and updrafts are very important if we're trying to understand how it formed, where the air came from. Uh, that made that particular tornado. This shows a three-dimensional image showing some air, and we're watching what parts of that supercell. You can see, see that hook echo there, but we're looking for what parts, what were the origins of the air that went into that tornado? Was it warm? Was it cold? Was it humid? Uh, was it hailing into it? Uh, we're trying to understand where it came from and why this particular supercell made this strong tornado that lasted a long time, whereas other ones that look almost the same don't make tornadoes. Uh, and we have a hard time forecasting that now, and that's why we're trying to get these measurements very close up. So Josh just showed you all these great radar images, and again, we're getting a lot of detail with these radar images. We're getting three-dimensional motions, but the problem is, is that we're getting these three-dimensional motions, we're getting these wind speeds above where we live. And what we care about is we care about, well, we care about a lot of things, but we care about the winds at the surface, because that's where houses are, that's where vehicles are, that's where we inhabit. So basically, if you guys are all houses here, with the radar, for the most part, we're scanning slightly above you. So we get a lot of information about what's going on above you, but we want to know how that maps to where you are, where the houses are. Just putting that in nice cartoon format, um, basically, again, we can't see what's happening near the surface. And a lot of times, the reason we can't see what's happening near the surface is because there's obstructions in the way. And especially if there's somewhere where houses or trees are being damaged, those houses and those trees are interfering with the radar beam. So it's like me crouching down here, and this podium is blocking what I see. It's the same thing that happens with the radar beam. We start getting blocked very near the ground, but we still really, really, really want those measurements, and we really want to know what the measurements we get, how that compares to what's happening at the surface. Um, and that's just, again, a nice illustration of what I just said, is we just want to know this wind distribution. We want to know what's happening at the surface. So the way that we're going about doing this, and if you guys are at the USA Science and Engineering Festival tomorrow, you should come see our tornado pod. Uh, basically, we're trying to put stuff in the path of the tornado. So we have 22 of these pods. And we have 22 of these pods because we think one of these has got to be hit by the tornado. It's actually remarkably hard to get something hit by a tornado. I know that's hard to believe. Um, but basically what we do with these pods is we, there's a tornado forming, you see those people just deployed a pod, and they're going to go and they're going to deploy another pod, and another pod, and another pod, and hopefully what happens is the tornado goes over that nice array of pods, and we're able to get wind measurements a meter or two meters above the surface, while at the same time we're scanning with our radar. So then we know what the winds are like here, and we know then what the winds are like there, and we know that relationship then between up here and where you live. And it's a complicated game to do that, because in order to do that, we have to get close to the tornado. We have to get people close to the tornado, we have to get our instruments close to the tornado. So we don't totally know the path of the tornado, and so we have to take into account that when we're putting these instrumentation down. So basically, we start getting everybody moving, and we hopefully start getting everybody moving in the path of the tornado, and again, keeping our radars just a little bit farther back so we can get this continuous piece of information. And so then, Hopefully, not, we're getting really ambitious here since we haven't even really gotten one pod hit by a tornado. Um, what we're hoping for is we're hoping we get multiple pods hit by a tornado. And the reason being is because we want to know what the winds are like all across the tornado. One point measurement's really nice, but does that point, res does that point measurement representative of what's happening here? And how does the winds decay if you get farther and farther away from the tornado? Placing something in the path of the tornado, getting out of the way, it's very hard to get a hit. So there's other solutions then that we've been working on and working with other people in order to try to get that information. So these unmanned, uh, essentially robots, you know, they're not moving robots, but these unmanned probes just uh, had a really hard time uh, getting any data. So uh, we've been working uh, with a guy, who, uh, Sean Casey, who uh, developed a homemade tank. 
Um, and he developed this tank because he wanted to get up close to tornadoes or into tornadoes uh, to get some IMAX footage uh, and has made a couple IMAX movies. Uh, but the important part of that whole gadget uh, for Karen and me is that uh, on the roof we put weather instruments. So we've got anemometers up there to measure wind in a couple different ways. Um, and the wind measurement's up at about three meters, so it's pretty well at house height. And so this tank can then drive and it can adjust. So if the tornado goes one way or goes the other way, that tank can move and adjust and stay right in the path of that tornado. So it's challenging to do that. Um, we basically depend on government funding. We get grants, very serious kind of very serious kind of work. We write serious sounding proposals. Um, and trying to go to the government and say, hey, we want to build a homemade tank and drive it in front of a tornado, um, no way. That's not going to work. So what we wound up doing is teaming up with the Discovery Channel. Now, the Discovery Channel wanted to make a reality TV show. Now, this is the kind of casts that you see on reality TV shows. At least that was the, these were actually popular shows around the time that they were making this show called Storm Chasers, and they had in mind that they were gonna get a bunch of scientists, kinda like these bunches here, and they were gonna either fight or have romance or do whatever the kinda, you know, ridiculous stuff happens on reality TV shows. Unfortunately, here was our team, and I mean, we're not that bad, but we're just, we don't look like those crews. We don't have big muscles and tattoos and stuff like that, and, um, we just couldn't substitute people. I mean, we, you know, they said, well, can't you find some scientists who are sort of better for TV or you know, willing to act ridiculous? And of course the answer is no. Um, but we made a deal with them that basically they could provide one person for us. They could find somebody who was reality TV quality um, to, to be on our show and that would just be a driver of one of our vehicles. And so it was really an amazing culture clash between TV and, and, and a bunch of scientists. Finally, they found uh, somebody who was a journalist and actually you know, was sort of willing to scream and stuff like that, but at least had some kind of reason for being out, out in the tornadoes. Um, and it worked pretty well. Uh, we, they funded us uh, going out and getting our scientific data for, for a few years, and we got some pretty useful data. So this is some video um, that's taken from that tank, and because it's Discovery Channel, they have video cameras every single direction, inside, out, outside, all these different directions. So there's really good video documentation. And what you're seeing is he's able to adjust um, and, and get close to this tornado. This tornado is getting less than a mile away. With our pod teams, usually we would have deployed a pod and run away by this time because we need to keep our, our teams just to pick up trucks pretty safe. But this guy doesn't have to run because he's in this armored tank. So this tornado, as you watch, he's, he's, he's keeping it out the right uh, mirror there, out, out, out the right window, and it's kind of getting bigger and bigger while well, he zoomed in. But the tornado's getting bigger and bigger, which basically means it's getting closer and closer. Um, and you can see that condensation funnel in lots of detail, because we're very, very close to it. And again, this is only a view you can get if you're in a tank. Um, and he's adjusting and adjusting, and uh, you can hear him screaming a lot, and some of that's hammed up because it's for, for reality TV. So again, that's something a robot just can't do. Um, under the ocean or uh, near a tornado. <laughs> so we're calling them to tell them what the wind speeds are because even though he's got a tank, he can only take winds of a certain intensity. So if the winds get up to F4, F5 speeds, where they're up 200 miles an hour or even higher than that, uh, even this vehicle probably would get damaged or flipped uh, in that kind of wind. Now all during this time, we're scanning over them. So we're getting data, uh, as Karen was mentioning, from about 100 feet above the ground up to thousands of feet above the ground. So we're getting a nice 3D image of this tornado, but not right at this height. We can't see that bottom piece, um, but he can uh, with his video, and he also uh, gets data with his anemometer as this passes over him. So he basically now is putting these skirts down, uh, these big steel skirts to make sure wind doesn't get up underneath the vehicle. Um, and then he puts these spikes down, which probably don't do that much good. But the, the skirts basically make sure the wind actually pushes them into the ground instead of uh, lofting them. So it's kind of like what you see on top of trucks where they're trying to keep the truck down. Uh, but this was a very important scientific moment for us because it was the first time we got observations in a tornado with a radar, with an anemometer, with video. Probably more important for us scientifically because for the first time we were able to document damage as it was occurring, not just after the fact. So all those Fujita scale things that we showed you earlier were damaged um, after the fact. We don't know what part of the tornado it happened in. We also take these into hurricanes. And so if you have any questions about hurricanes, we drive up right into the hurricanes, right on the coast. Uh, and in that case, we have to go inside. But we're getting amazing data inside hurricanes as they make landfall.